Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. A real uh, revolutionary right now. Back out. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, there's a difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black own media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? What up, folks? Today is Tuesday, August 16, 2022. Coming up on Roland Martin on Filter, streaming live on the Black Star Network. Uh, Topeka Sam was very much involved in getting the First Step Act signed into law, but she also was working on and partnering with the Reform Alliance on reintroducing people back into society who served time in prison. We'll talk with her on today's show. Uh, Gary Chambers Jr., uh, boy, did he get screwed with the Louisiana State Democratic Party? Wait until we tell y'all how they completely blew off their own rules to screw him out of the state party's endorsement and keep him from accessing the dollars that go to the candidate of choice. Also, uh, President Joe Biden signs the Inflation Act. Republicans are still upset with the increase on taxes of the wealthy. We'll talk about the impact of this law, and we'll talk to an all-black female merchandising and apparel company, what they're doing for the culture. Folks, it is time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Yeah, yeah. It's on go, 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 y'all. Yeah, yeah. It's rolling, Martin. Hey folks, Roland Martin here. Yes, I am in the car driving. I just returned from Los Angeles, where I did the Cynthia Taylor Golf Tournament. 
Uh, we're going to show you some of the highlights of that uh, at the end of today's show. Uh, and so head to the office as we speak. Uh, my guest at the top of the show is Topeka Sam. She is the executive director and founder of uh, Ladies of Hope Ministries. They are focused on helping people re-enter society. Topeka has a, has a story for her own about uh, her re-entry into society. She also was very much involved in the passage of the First Step Act, uh, which uh, has freed thousands of people uh, who were in federal prison. Uh, Topeka, glad to have you on the show. Now, I was supposed to be in, but here's crazy. I'm supposed to be in studio. You're there. Uh, I'm flying in trying to get to the studio. Uh, but we got you on the show. Glad you're there. Uh, let, let, let's just start off uh, right off. And first of all, uh, I want to talk about, um, you know, it's very interesting. You know, there are a lot of people who still talk about uh, how they felt the First Step Act, you know, should have been better, should have been stronger. Uh, Republicans got behind it. But I had to remind people, and I was on a, and you were on a panel at the Rock Nation conference, um, Con Congressman Hakeem Jeffries was there as well, when the reality is there were black folks who were really involved in that, and they said, damn Donald Trump, we got to get our people out of prison and not get so caught up in saying, oh, he can't get a win. So talk about how important that was uh, from the perspective of the people who were affected, not the political folks, those who were in prison. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. You did get me in the studio and you're not here, but it's all good. I'm just happy to be here anyway. Um, well, what I would say about the First Step Act, you know, it was the first piece of legislation that freed, as you mentioned, thousands of people um, since locking up hundreds of that millions of black and brown people. And for us, it was people over politics, right? For the sisters and brothers that I communicate with every single day since my release from federal prison, when I asked them, like, what should I do? They said, you have to go in, because if you're not there, then that means we're not there. That there are other people that are there at the table that are not speaking for us, that are not bringing in our concerns, that have not lived our experience. And so for me, irrespective to the noise that was happening, it was important that I did what I would want anyone to do for me, which is go in, make the changes that are necessary to try to bring our people home. Uh, and, and look, I mean, uh, there are people, uh, look, we, we, we all have political leanings uh, and things on those lines. Uh, and uh, in the, I remember meeting with Jared Kushner myself, trying to get an understanding of what they were doing. Uh, and But this was a case where I had to remind people in the House, led by Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, who pushed this thing through. You, get, you have some Republican support, but it was also Democrats who strengthened it in the Senate. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, it was interesting because, you know, with Van Jones, uh, Jessica Jackson at the time through Cut 50, uh, when we were working on that, we had met with the uh, Black Caucus. And it was interesting how, you know, often we forget what led us to these issues, right? So it was both Black and brown elected officials that allowed legislation to pass to lock up millions of black and brown people. So it would take the same people, if not others, for us to be able to be free. And so when you don't lean either way, but you really lean to the people, then you understand really what the people needs. And without this legislation, if we, were, if we would have waited until today, we would have been still waiting because in this current administration to date, we haven't seen any real efforts as it relates, relates to releasing people from prison um, and really big decarceration efforts. So, you know, I'm just grateful to have been a part of that um, history making legislation that allow, like you stated, thousands of my sisters and brothers to be free. And uh, again, one of the things that we talked about there was there actually was a stronger bill in the last year of Obama's presidency, then the First Step Act, but you had some Democrats who said, oh, if Hillary wins, uh, we can get a stronger bill. Well, she didn't win. That's a perfect example of you, you have to also sometimes take what you can get today mm -hmm. and then come back tomorrow. So this was called the First Step Act, which implies uh, there should be a second. Absolutely, and a third, and a fourth, and hopefully the, 
the full decarceration of people from prison and jail. So look, you know, as you mentioned, we can't wait for another person, another administration, when there are people who will die in prison without us ha advocating for them and getting them out now. My people in prison, and even when I was in prison, I wouldn't have wanted to hear for advocate, advocates, people who I elect into office to then tell me that I need to wait until another administration comes just because you don't want to either get a win for someone or wait for someone, which then speaks to really the culture. So do we truly believe that people deserve these fair chances, second chances, and deserve to be home from prison and jail or not? And I think that's why we do the work that we do at the Ladies of Hope Ministries, because we do believe and understand the necessity for fair chance and opportunity critically um, around this country for our sisters um, and brothers coming home from prison and jail. And let's talk about that coming home from prison. Um, you know, people people automatically assume, oh, my goodness, a, goodness, a person is so excited and happy to be released. Uh, but it's a whole different world for many of them, especially if they've been gone. Um, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, the, their, the world they knew no longer exists. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, I often, you know, joke and say when I, you know, came, when I went into prison, there was an iPhone 3, and when I came out, it was an iPhone 5, so not much changed for me. But I had been incarcerated with sisters when they came home, 19, 20, 25, 30 years, who went in, I'm from New York, so they were tokens right, to get on the subway or the bus, and now there are metro cards. They never had an ATM card. They don't know where, you know, because of redistricting and everything else, you don't even know where to go. The fact that you have to try to find something to eat, a place to live, and a job in a very short period of time without support. And so, you know, it's important that we understand that there are over 20,000 barriers to people who are coming home from prison and jail each year, 20,000. And when, you know, the reason why we're in D.C. today is because we were talking about some of those barriers as it relates to financial crimes and people who have financial convictions uh, or restitution and how those are also compounded. People can't buy homes. They can't refinance uh, or remortgage their homes. They can't get cars. They can't get jobs because even often they're checking credit. Um, they, they can't get a credit card. It, it's so much um, that these additional punitive uh, causes and also um, harms that people or the country is doing to our sisters and brothers are just really, really deplorable. And for us, it's how we bring awareness to these issues so people have more compassion and empathy to give people those fair chances that they truly deserve. Because let's face it, 95% of all people who have been incarcerated are coming home one day. Do we want people to come home smarter, healed, and better? Or do we want people to come home re-traumatized, even into worse conditions, and then causing further harm, not only to themselves, but also the community? So the point that you made there, a lot of people don't even understand how politicians uh, have uh, ostracized and penalized uh, individuals even when they get out. Uh, I remember when the, um, when the welfare bill was signed into law by President Bill Clinton. Uh, mm -hmm. That bill prevented individuals who had been to prison from getting student financial aid. So how on one hand can our society say, oh, we want you to better yourself. We don't want you to go back uh, into prison. We want you to be better when you can't come out. But when you look at this system, how they literally put barriers mm -hmm. into laws on the local, state, and federal level that causes folks to say, well, damn, the only option I got is to go back to stealing and committing crimes in order to survive. Exactly, and you said it right. It, it's crimes of survival. You know, if I come home after serving, even, you know, there are people who lose everything after a month in prison, right? And I come home, and then I'm trying to find somewhere to live. I'm trying for women, trying to, well, 90, 85% of all women who are incarcerated are, are uh, de mothers or dependent of dependent children. And so I have to find my children. I have to find housing. I have to find a job. And yet, or want to go back to school, and I can't because there's all these educational barriers, these financial barriers, these housing barriers, then what do you expect? Right? Anyone would, they do what they need to do to survive. And so, you know, prisons are big business. We know that. But we can combat that by providing those opportunities, opening up the pathways for people truly to have a chance to change their lives. And I mean, that's what platforms like this isn't critical for us to talk about these issues, because unfortunately, though uh, incarceration disproportionately impacts people of color, we act like it doesn't impact us. And we're not really moving right. in the work the way that we should um, to help our sisters and brothers who are being released from prison and jail daily. So, let, 
So let's talk about what you're doing with the Reform Alliance. Uh, explain uh, what this initiative is. Yeah, so we launched a campaign called uh, Remission Now um, in partnership with Reform Alliance, and it's to bring awareness to, on a federal level, people who have restitutions or financial uh, debts that they have to pay after incarceration, that this is considered a lifelong sentence. For example, you have sisters who have ranging from $2 million to $550 million of restitution that, one, they never even received any of that income, but, two, they'll never pay it back in their life. They spent years in prison. They come and paid restitution while they payments while they were inside. Came home on probation or parole. Still have to pay those uh, debts. And then when they get off, up to 20 years of having to pay those debts. And that is just being overly punitive, over incarcerating people within the community, and it's just shameful. So on a federal level, the president of the United States can use their clemency power. We hear so often about clemency and pardons, but there's something called remission that is a part of the clemency or pardon application that will allow the president to relieve that debt that a person has been uh, sentenced to give. <coughs> and so we're bringing awareness to this issue. We're having an event at the Eaton Hotel, uh, a lunch and learn on Thursday, August 18th, from 11.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m., and invite anyone to join us uh, so they can learn more about these issues, learn how they can continue to work with us to advocate for these if issues, and begin to, you know, change what's happening again uh, with our sisters and brothers around these types of charges. I'm going to bring my panel now. I'm Dr. Mustafa Santago Ali, uh, former uh, senior advisor uh, for the environmental justice at EPA, uh, Theresa Lundy, principal founder of TML Communications out of Philadelphia, DeMario Sullivan Simmons, rights attorney, founder of Justice for Greenwood in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, Mustafa, uh, Mustafa, you're first. All right. Well, sister, thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. I mean, I know we've got about 2 million folks in our country who are incarcerated in, you know, state prisons, federal prisons, and other incarceration. And I'm just curious, you know, when we have that big of a set of problems, you know, what are the additional resources that we need to get to organizations like yours and others to be able to make sure the right legislation is in place? Absolutely. So thank you for that question. Well, two things. There is the over 2 million people who are presently incarcerated within, to your point, you know, local, state, and federal prisons and jails in this country. But there are also over 4 million people that are incarcerated within our community under community supervision. And what we need as organizations, we need access to resources. We need access to buildings, developments, housing. Um, we need access to the state and federal and local grants. So therefore, we can make sure that we're giving those resources directly to our folks. I mean, let's face it, often community-based organizations like mine that are ran by previously incarcerated people of color and women, uh, we're the least looked at as it relates to funding and opportunity. And so we have to diversify our funding when, in fact, it's those state, lo local, and federal grants that really sustain the work that we're doing so that we can be larger organizations like we see out there. And so I would say that's what we need so we can continue to hire people from our community. We can continue to pour those resources and opportunity within to our people so that we can have better, safer, and healthier communities for black and brown folks in this country. Teresa. Yes, Tamika, thank you so much for this vision. Um, I'm here in Philadelphia, but I work with uh, Pennsylvania uh, legislators and community organizations, and I probably have about six organizations you need to tap in with. Um, but I know one of the questions they may ask you is how can they be a part of your coalition um, and where do they go to sign up um, to make sure that you also have a stake in Pennsylvania? Absolutely. So they can text the number 41444 and text the word the, T-H-E-L-O-H-M 2022. Um, and then get, you know, connected to our work, to our movement, to what we say is our epic vision of ending poverty and incarceration of women and girls globally, uh, to our website, thelohm.org, any social media platform at the LOHM. Um, and again, join us on Thursday um, at the event here in D.C. to learn more and connect to us. Uh, I do have a, a, one other question, uh, and that is um, the First Step Act dealt with the federal level. Have you have we have you seen have others seen movement uh, improvement on the state level? Uh, because typically, what you often hear is that when things happen on the federal level, that impacts what happens on the state. So, are we seeing uh, states uh, try to reduce 
uh, prison populations? We have seen it um, very far and few in between. But even as we see these efforts happening around the country, we're also seeing the number of women who are in prison increasing, right? Like, we know it's an 800% increase of the incarceration rate of women over the last 20 years. And so while even... Why? The Why? I mean, Why? I argue to say, you know, once black men were taken off the street, then they started kidnapping black women. Um, that's just what, what it is. And often when you mm -hmm. leave, you know, a person single with children with no resources, men are in prisons and jails, then often, you know, there comes substance misuse, mental health issues, sexual trauma and violence, early childhood trauma, all of these other issues that we don't talk about in our communities, but they are driving forces of what's happening to women in prison. Um, outside of misogyny and patriarchy and all the racism and all the things um, that we understand that are part of uh, the why. Um, but for us, it's important that we take that, we understand what's necessary to change that, uh, which is what we're doing, and other organizations around the country are. I mean, we decided that because we didn't see a lot of organizations that were doing our work or our housing model, we have a house in the Bronx, uh, one in... In, Louis in New Orleans, Louisiana, one in Trinidad and Tobago, just closed on a house in Prince George's County, Maryland. And because we couldn't get with developers or real estate agents or brokers who would rent to people who have convictions, we decided to get into that ourselves. So we're building our first 20-unit affordable housing development project in Miami, Florida, and we're scaling our work because we know exactly what we need in order to successfully uh, succeed in the country. And you made a point, um, the question I think was from um, Mustafa when you talked about uh, the support that, that you, you don't get. Um, let's just be frank, even in this space, when it comes to, I'll say, white philanthropy, that money is going to white-led organizations that are dealing in this space, uh, as opposed to black-led or people of color-led organizations that know very well the work and and, and 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 we see this in multiple multiple spaces and even in black yeah what what I would say you know the, the irony of that is that in our work um, we only really get funded by two uh, foundations or people individuals of color everyone else that, get, that funds our work, which, you know, for me, I'm grateful that people notice our work and want to support our work, but also saddened that not enough people of color are supporting our work. And so, you know, it is important that we also elevate those issues because, again, as I mentioned before, you know, incarceration, poverty disproportionately impacts people of color. So why aren't people of color investing in people of color? in order to do the work in the way that we also know how. So, you know, that is a conversation that often we do not talk about. It is true that as a black woman who was previously incarcerated, it is incredibly difficult that each and every time I'm going for, you know, funding, I have to continuously talk about my trauma, um, which is exhausting each and every day. And that sometimes when we're going for different funding opportunities, that we will get a third of what another organization, a white led organization will get, you know, three times what we've asked for who do less work than we do. Um, and that is something else that needs to be addressed. But I think it's, you know, important that while there are organizations um, like our organization that is actually doing this work, that people know what we're doing, how they can inv get involved, how they can connect us to these resources, not only through foundations, high net worth individuals, corporate social responsibility, ESG, all of the things um, in order to help us to help ourselves. Uh, this is the last question. You mentioned, uh, I feel like I sound like a Baptist preacher. Um, you mentioned uh, the problems with, with acquiring housing. Uh, have you had any conversations with the black real estate brokers? Um, I spoke at their national convention a couple of weeks ago. I'd be curious if you if you consider reach out to them and partnering uh, in this space because I mean these are people who actually who sell homes. Well, I have. Um, maybe I haven't reached out to the people you did. So if there's any contacts you can make, that'll be great. Um, but what oh, yeah. I, well, I, well, I, well, I, I, I go to the top, so it'll be, it'll well, be the then, CEO and chairman of the board. Take me there, uh, <laughs> because often even, you know, presidents and CEOs aren't chair people. Um, what I find even where we are in Louisiana, for example, and even in the Bronx, uh, we're in communities that are, you know, of color. And there are still these biases, not in our backyard. 
Um, and it goes also to developers often, also, you know, brokers and real estate agents that they just do not want to take the chance. Um, so it's not necessarily where I notice that it's, it's uh, biased based on color. It's just biased based on what people think around people who've been to prison. Uh, absolutely. Okay, so for the folks who are watching, the folks who are listening, how can they reach your organization? If they yeah. want to give, they want to assist, they want to support. Absolutely. So again, they can text the word T-H-E-L-O-H-M 2022 to the number 41444. Um, they can go on our website, the T H E L O H M dot org. They can follow us on any social media platform at the L O H M, uh, or they can follow me at Topeka K Sam um, or any platform as well. All right, Topeka, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for coming in. Looks like I'm almost there for all this traffic, uh, but uh, hey, that's the world. But luckily, with technology, uh, we still made it happen. I appreciate it. Uh, good luck. And I'll uh, keep us abreast of uh, how things go. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me here. I feel you in spirit, even though you're not really here present with me. Uh, but grateful <laughs> for this opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Folks, coming up next, we're going to talk with Gary Chambers Jr. Man, did he get screwed by the Louisiana State Democratic Party when it came to getting the their endorsement? Wait until you hear from him on what happened. That is next right here on Roller Martin Unfiltered uh, on the Black Star Network. Don't forget to support us in what we do, folks. Download our Black Star, ne Black Star Network app, Apple phone.